You're a newbie storyteller with dreams of fame, success, and Barnes & Noble groupies, which means you aspire to one day make money from the lies you tell about imaginary people. This magical mix of narcissism and voices in your head is what brings us all together as a storytelling community, and it's also what makes an evil protagonist relatable and so much fun to write about. That's why today we're going to turn back the clock to the ancient year of 2019 and take a look at Joker, a movie which was a prediction for society in the upcoming year, an amazing character study for one of the most iconic villains in history, and a phenomenal point of reference for my new therapist, Dale. More specifically, we're going to focus not on writing a villainous main character, but rather on five points on how to make a good character like Arthur Fleck change for the worse, starting with point number one changing the shape of our character arc. So, normally, a character arc is a series of successes and failures, which gradually bring our hero closer to their want. After coming close to achieving their want, something goes terribly wrong, and it seems like we're all the way back at square one with a need to start over or give up. Only this is the point where our hero uses all the crap they've learned over the course of the story to overcome their apparent failure and still come out on top as a new and improved character. And this is great for an adorable story about overcoming diversity, but that's not what we're here to do today. Na na na. We're here to break our character into something sinisterly beautiful, like a murderous butterfly. Right the bazoops now! Ben, he's got a laser gun! Because the only way Arthur Fleck becomes the Joker is if we knock him down, smush his face against the subway floor, and force out a necessary amount of evil needed to survive. We do this through a series of successive failures which gradually bring Arthur lower and lower in his journey towards his want. Rather than two steps forward and one step back, we do the opposite until our would-be hero is all the way at what I'll call rock bottom one. Think of this like the dating world. You're polite. The relationship goes nowhere. You're genuinely interested in the other person. The relationship goes nowhere. You go above and beyond anyone else the person has ever dated. You get the point. But, when you finally get frustrated and quit being nice... That made him very popular. As storytellers, what we want to do is reward our characters' bad behavior when their back has been pushed against the wall and they finally snap. Now, there are three reasons for this. One, it shows that our hero's first choice was not to become a bad person. Rather, it was the only choice left available to them. Two, by doing this, we preserve the sympathy our audience has for the hero, because they have watched this descent into hell. And three, because this is only rock bottom number one, we still have tension in the character's arc, where we wonder if this is a permanent change in our hero, or is it just a one-off? By rewarding bad behavior, we set the stage for our hero to succeed in the worst way possible. And I don't mean by becoming a Kardashian, I mean by becoming an iconic people popper. But then that raises the first question for our reimagined character arc. How do we take our hero from a low starting place all the way to this first rock bottom? Well, let's take a look at point number two. Establish empathy for your main character. This channel is so stupid. This is the same rule for any main character. I hate you, Andrews. Dislike. Unsubscribe. I'm mailing arsenic to your apartment. Go for it. My neighbor steals my mail. I'm on to you, Betty. But, back to storytelling. Normally our goal with a main character is to establish likability and sympathy, meaning that we as audience members both relate to the character and we would want to be friends with the character. Now, look, speaking strictly for myself, I've never been mauled by a street sign, and when I was jumped by a gang of kids, I won. I can't relate to Arthur's situation and therefore can't fully sympathize with him. Frankly, if I ever got beat up while dressed as a clown, I deserve what I had coming to me. But, one of the keys to making a character change for the worse is in tricking your audience. We don't need them to think, Oh hell, this happens to me every day and sometimes I just wish those kids would get what they deserve. Instead, we need our audience to think, If I ever saw this happen to another human being, I'd be completely cool with watching him open a can of whoop-ass on those kids. But, this human desire for justice only takes us so far. Watching a man defend himself and watching a man break into a pew-pew wizard are two completely different things. At least that's what my father said before he left for cigarettes 20 years ago. 
The second part of our atypical character relationship that needs to happen is that, while I feel bad for Arthur by the end of this scene, I still don't know what kind of a person he is yet, and how far I would stick with him on his journey for revenge. Maybe he kicks cats. Maybe he spits on babies. Maybe he's a terrible son to his mother. Mom, why are these letters so important to you? Damn it. But then ultimately, if we still establish this sympathy later on, why tell the story this way? Why not show us Arthur being an awesome son and then show him getting curb stomped by children of the corn? We would develop sympathy and then develop a heavy layer of pity. Isn't that good? Well, yes and no. We do want some pity for our main character. We want our audience to see them succeed against insurmountable odds. But we also need to walk a fine line between invoking our viewers' emotions and just straight up exhausting them. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Instead, we lure our audience in with something interesting, let's say watching a man get attacked by children, and this draws them into the point where they ask, what does this man do next? Rather than asking themselves, why is this happening to Arthur, this kind-hearted character I've already fallen in love with? In the original version, the one that actually showed up in theaters, the storytellers get the audience to invest in the story by feeding into their curiosity. Whereas, with the later example, in which we lead with an emotional attachment, we run the risk of exhausting our audience before we mean to. Key word there is BEFORE. As storytellers, we still need to exhaust our audience to pull off a storytelling trick later on. But for now, we still need to set the stage, which brings us to point number three. Establish a character want that is out of reach. Like any good father, you should set your main character up for failure. We want to see them struggle and fail, but most importantly in the case of creating negative character change, we need to see the futility in their attempt to accomplish their want. For Arthur, his want is relatively straightforward. He wants somebody, specifically Murray, to care about him. Now, even for me, that doesn't seem like a particularly high goal. Make a friend. That's the same overall theme in Toy Story. But then why is Toy Story a kid's movie with an uplifting message while Joker is a dark character study that explores all the ways in which New York City is a cesspool? Well, let's go back to our third point and take a closer look. A character want that is out of reach. Making friends isn't the hardest thing in the world, unless you're trying to take them out to a romantic dinner, in which case it's impossible. We as an audience love Arthur. And so, we feel that making a friend should be pretty cut and dry. But... You're fired! That wasn't bothering Just stop! I was, I, this is, I'll tell you what you have, yeah. We as audience members have seen enough of Arthur to know that he is not the problem. It's his environment, and the people in it. From a narcissistic mother, a terrible job, and an oddly relatable love life, Arthur doesn't have an opportunity to fulfill his want of making meaningful connections. The same way a traditional hero has supporting characters who, you know, support them on their quest for success, our hero changed for the worse needs supporting characters that tear them down. Think of it more like a cast of villains or a Thanksgiving dinner with your family. These characters assist your hero on their way down to rock bottom, ensuring that, even once they hit the pavement and strike gold, they still have a cast of bloodsuckers to pull them back down. This leads us to phase two of the character arc, where our hero, having found success in villainy, now has a choice to make. Alright, my short attention span viewers, we're gonna hop back to this original doodle of a character arc, not only because it's art at its finest, but also to illustrate where the choice usually takes place on the hero's journey. Right around here. The hero, having pushed too hard in their quest for gold or power or some sort of MacGuffin, has made a boo-boo and finds themselves with a choice to be made. Do we cut our losses and quit? Or do we push forward into the third act and get the gold while simultaneously becoming a better person? Now, in our reimagined character arc, the choice comes shortly after hitting rock bottom once our hero has gotten more compliments for their poor life decisions than Lizzo at a Weight Watchers convention. For Arthur, having culled the herd of three day traders, he is left to wonder, should I go back to my day-to-day -day where my mother and I struggled to survive in a dumpy apartment with no one to help us, or do I lean into this newfound power which, for the first time ever, gives me a sense of significance? What I love about Joker is that, traditionally, 
Once our hero gets a taste for this evil strength, that sounds like an energy drink, they go straight to being sympathetically evil, meaning that we understand why our hero continues to do these tiny evil deeds. We see this in Akira, Breaking Bad, and Dune. Joker takes a different route with Arthur, where rather than pursuing any sort of evil, he just starts to pursue his dreams. He takes up comedy. He imagines himself up a girlfriend. He spies on his dad in the bathroom. After giving his best Dirty Harry impression at the local subway station, Arthur finally has the confidence to live his life without the approval of others, and... Yeah, it still doesn't go well. Why I love this, and why you can consider implementing this step in your own writing, is because it makes Arthur's character change more natural. He goes from a man who just wants to make others happy, to a man who is trying to make himself happy, and then finally to a man who feels that the entire world is against him in his quest for happiness. He is resilient. Even after having been pushed over the edge, Arthur still has the potential for good, and even an opportunity to live a... well, a less crappy life. But, back to our third point, Arthur is not the problem in this story. His environment is. Society and the false icons of hope and friendship are what continuously bring him down until he hits another breaking point, the second rock bottom. Whereas our first rock bottom serves as a catalyst, a tragic event which can change our hero for better or worse, the second rock bottom is more of a destination than it is an opportunity for change. So, rock bottom one is the bus stop, and rock bottom two is the club where you remember how much you hate to socialize, but it's too late to head home because you opened a tab and the bartender is ignoring you. On our way to rock bottom number two, we need to add gas to our hero's self-immolation by putting the supporting cast on hyperdrive. Despite Arthur's attempt at a happier life, he learns that everyone he ever considered to be a support was actually an absolute bag of donkey schlongs, or maybe just undiagnosed schizophrenic. But hey, who am I to judge? Because the point is that as our hero attempts to stand on his own again, we as the storytellers need to knock him back down. Nobody said that this was nice. However, here is the key difference going into the second rock bottom versus the first. Unlike the first mishap, an instance where our hero's actions were not premeditated, an instance where our hero, let's say, found their powers on accident, in the second rock bottom, our hero goes into the confrontation with a plan, a motive, a strategy to go up against their perceived enemy and win. What the storytellers do as Arthur approaches his second rock bottom is illustrate his unwillingness to take abuse any longer. The friend that threw him under the bus at work gets a new neck piercing. The mother that belittled his dreams and made everything about her delusions gets an up-close look at the hospital pillow's thread count. And Murray, a man Arthur always aspired to have as a friend, becomes the most popular TV spot post-mortem. In a way, our hero is victorious against a perceived villain. In a way, Arthur achieves the acceptance he always wanted by becoming the monster society made him. Our second rock bottom is not so much a failure to achieve a desired outcome. Rather, it's the loss of everything innocent our hero once was. Writing these types of character arcs isn't necessarily hard. But it can be heartbreaking, which, yes, is typical for storytelling, but in the case of characters like Arthur Fleck, there's an additional heartbreak of torturing your hero into madness. My hope is that this video helps you to realize the reason behind this process, and to help you in telling the best story possible. Thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video if you found it useful, and subscribe to the channel so that you're kept up to date with next week's release. Shoo-ba-da-doo-doo. Doo doo boop a doo. The end.